particularly his wife's company. Um, when I was director of environmental quality at DEP, um, let me just get out of the screen. When I was director of environmental quality at DEP, one of the programs, this is back in the 80s, the late 80s, one of the programs that was under my purview was the air pollution program. And we had a nascent program uh, regarding air toxics. And Joanne Held, who is now on the licensing board for environmental, um, the license site remediation professional, invited me to a, a South Camden air toxics meeting. And uh, I said, sure, I'd be, I'd be glad to go. And I went down to South Camden. And when I got out of the car and I experienced the air quality, and I'm an asthmatic, by the way, when I experienced the air quality that people living in that area were being exposed to on a daily basis, it was a significant moment in my life. But I will tell you, I was at a loss to figure out how to deal with it. I had no answers, zero. And now, about 30 years later, we're starting to come up with some of the answers. And that's what we're here to discuss today. So I want to turn the program over to Ray Papperman, who I appreciate as a friend, as well as a professional. And I thank him for all his efforts in helping us coordinate it. Ray, it's all yours. <clears throat> thanks, George. And thanks, Phil and George, for giving us this forum to talk about an, an important subject, environmental justice. Um, in fact, we started talking about this a long time ago uh, when, when George had asked me to put a program on. And at that time, our assumption was that uh, regulations implementing the you know, New Jersey EJ law would be in effect at this point, but we know that sometimes these regulations take a long time to promulgate, and that is the case right now. Um, anyway, I we're, we're going to hear from three great uh, speakers: uh, Bobney Doshi, Dr. Nikki Sheets, and Ray Cantor, uh, all of whom I have spoken with before. Uh, Bobney and uh, Dr. Sheets and I have done a program together before on decarbonization, electrification of the transportation sector including effects on EJ communities. And I've known Ray uh, from when he was uh, chief advisor uh, at the DEP. We worked together uh, for years. Um, New Jersey's EJ law, uh, which is the, was the first law in the country to provide for denial of a new permit for certain facilities due to existing conditions within EJ community um, is, is something Bhavani will be talking about. And I promise not to talk too much to the, to the speakers, so I'll try to keep my opening statements brief. Um, but there, had, there are regulations, as I said before, being developed now by the DEP. There was a robust stakeholdering process that the DEP held in conjunction with um, preparation of regulations to implement the law. Um, and these regulations will be implementing significant policy interests, including identifying and comparing health stressors geographically, uh, a process for evaluating whether certain permits should be granted or not based on impacts to overburdened communities, and a process for public input and involvement. Um, most recently, the commissioner of the DEP, Sean LaTourette, issued an administrative order, which, you know, while the regs are pending, uh, to effectuate certain aspects of the EJ law, um, pursuant to existing authority that uh, the DEP has, um, and um, to, among other things, condition um, permits to protect the environment, which the DEP uh, has apparently inherent authority to do. So before I introduce the panelists, I just wanted, and, and I know we have a, I'm not sure of the makeup of everybody that's attending today, but some of you may be very familiar, but I just like to start out with giving a definition of environmental justice, which I just pull right off of the DEP's website. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement, and those are gonna be defined terms as well, of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Fair treatment, one of those defined terms means that no group of people, including a racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic group should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, municipal, and commercial operations or the execution of federal, state, local, and tribal programs and policies. 
And meaningful involvement means that the public has an opportunity to participate in decisions about activities they may, that may affect their environment and or health. The public's contribution can influence the regulatory agency's decision. Community concerns will be considered in the decision-making process and decision makers will seek out and facilitate the involvement of those potentially affected. These are the goals that the EJ law and the upcoming regulations are seeking to to effectuate and our speakers will be talking about that just administratively i think phil mentioned it before we're going to hold questions until all of the speakers have finished their presentations so that um, certain answers may be given um, during the course of the presentation and so that everybody has an opportunity to respond so first, I'd like to introduce uh, Bhavani Doshi. Bhavani concentrates her practice in the areas of redevelopment, environmental infrastructure, government, and renewable energy. She provides her clients a range of general counsel services, including procurement, corporate governance, regulatory guidance, and legislative drafting, transaction negotiated, negotiation, and document preparation. She is currently the chair of the Renewable Energy, Climate Change, and Clean Tech Committee, I hope I said that right, of the New Jersey Bar Association. Um, Bhavani has published and written on environmental justice initiatives in New Jersey, including the use of the Volkswagen settlement monies to promote clean vehicle use in EJ communities. And she assists municipalities with upgrading their gas diesel fleets to all electric um, to reduce NOx commissions. And Bhavani is going to tell us about the law. Thank you, Bhavani. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Ray. Um, and good morning, everybody. So as Ray uh, mentioned, this is a new law. And as a practitioner, um, we are trying to figure it out as all practitioners are right now in the state. Um, what I am going to do today is provide an overview of what we can discern from to the best of our ability. Um, we're helping our clients understand about this new law and what we feel the proposed regulations um, based on the stakeholder process um, may look like. Of course, we won't know until um, they are released in the spring exactly what the process is going to be and all the details, but there has been an, an extensive stakeholder process, um, which I will go into later, and to give us a sense of what, how the law may be implemented and what our clients can expect. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint. You can see my PowerPoint. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Okay. Um, Ray just went into um, the definition, so I won't read it out verbatim. Um, but I think it's important to frame the concept of environmental justice at the outset. Um, why, why did New Jersey want to do this um, in the first place? Why did it want to try to be, be a leader in this? Um, this is a very, um, you know, his, this is a historic problem um, that these communities have been facing dis, uh, disproportionate impacts for a long time um, when it comes to it, harmful environmental um, concerns. And so, this so understanding why this law was created, I think, is helpful for, for practitioners, um, and it's helpful to understand um, because the regulations and the cumulative impacts portion, especially, all go to this point of not wanting to place additional burdens on these communities that have historically been burdened by impacts of environmental issues. Um, <clears throat> so it includes um, fair treatment and meaningful involvement. And a large portion of this law is dedicated to meaningful involvement, um, which we'll see later. Um, environmental justice is an umbrella for a number of things. And so we will see with the EJ law that this column here, presence of co community concern, is where the definition of OBCs came from, um, overburdened communities, right? Um, and then there's other aspects of environmental justice as well. But for the purposes of the environmental justice law, you can, you'll, I'll go into it later, but the OBCs um, came from 
the, the presence of falling into any of these categories. Like low income, at least 35% of households qualify. Minority, at least 40% of residents identify as a minority or limited English proficiency. At least 40% have limited English proficiency. Um, am I breaking up or am I okay? I'm good. Okay. You're good. You're fine. You're good. Okay. Um, the criteria for identifying environmental justice communities. Again, this is more broad. Um, not going to the uh, definition of OBC, but more broad. Um, OBC kind of will falls into this category, community of concern. And then these are some of the other broader aspects of EJ as a whole. The absence of environmental public health benefits, um, such as green space, um, for example. Um, and then the presence of disproportionate environmental public health stressors, such as already existing major air pollutant facilities, um, contaminated sites, um, for example. And all of those together combined present an EJ community. Um, this is all from, all these pictures and diagrams are from the DEP's website. So this is also from their website um, to help understand the principles and priorities of why this law is in place. Um, it's to empower these communities um, and to help them, um, to help bring awareness about these issues, but also make them and give them um, agency and decision makers in the process. Um, to protect health is a um, primary um, goal. Um, and then to also straighten, strengthen the uh, partnerships um, between the community, the government, um, and um, the residents living there. So EJ issues, again, I'm still staying kind of high level, is air pollution, waste uh, dumping, uh, water issues, food issues, um, lead exposure issues in water. I mean, it, there's a broad range of issues. This EJ law that was implemented first in New Jersey um, is not gonna be able to deal with everything um, because EJ is, is broader than um, just um, one specific issue. So executive order number 23 is what kicked it off. Um, this is how we got started. Um, he bracket, um, this was um, passed under Governor Murphy um, in 2018. And um, the passing of EO 23 essentially kicked off um, guidance to start considering EJ um, in all of the executive branch agencies um, and to include and to require that that each executive branch agency has representatives and um, specific people they are dedicated to integrating EJ concepts and EJ rules and regulations into all executive branch decision making. So this is um, sort of a visual of the timeline. Here we have EO 23 starting kicking it off in April of 2018. And these are some other executive orders that came after that, which are not specifically regarding EJ, but that because EJ 23 said that you have to now consider environmental justice in all your executive branch decision-making, um, you know, this, all of the other executive orders um, that the, have come after that have mentioned EJ. And if we go on the DEP's EJ website, we will see that all of the, the DEP's initiatives, uh, climate initiatives, air initiatives, electric vehicle initiatives, um, site remediation, now they all include um, or will include aspects of EJ in them. Okay. So this is the EJ law, the statutory citation. It was passed in September 18, 2020, and has five sections. Um, definitions, um, list of overburdened communities, requirements, permit, regulations, and rules and regs. Okay, this is a recap of the stakeholder process. Like I said before, this was a lengthy stakeholder process. Um, the stakeholder process was divided amongst each of the large topics involved in the law. Um, 
so there was a stakeholder process specifically to discuss geographic points of comparison, which we'll get into later. Um, what does uh, what what and what will environmental and public health stressors mean? What are the different types of stressors that may be included um, in the final regulations um, as points of comparison? Um, what falls under renewal or expansion? And what will what should an environmental justice impact statement look like? So there were a number of different issues that the law had to, that the stakeholder process had to cover. And the stakeholder process was, um, was therefore divided into um, these various categories. Um, and the last stakeholder meeting was held in June. All right, in summary, what the law says, is that state regulators will deny permits for new facilities or may they may place conditions on the expansions of renewals of existing facilities if the um, environmental uh, justice impacts analysis shows that the action would together with other environmental public health stressors affecting the overburdened community cause or contribute to adverse cumulative environmental or public health stressors cause or contribute to adverse cumulative environmental or public health stressors. It's a mouthful, but it's important to understand. Um, in the OBC that are higher than those borne by other communities within the state. So that's a geographic point of comparison, which I'll get to later. Um, there are limited exceptions to this, um, which we'll get into is later as well, if there's a compelling public need. Um, or if it's uh, there's two permit exceptions as well, um, which I'll also go into. So again, this is still going over the, the uh, overview. If you are looking to site a new facility, let's start with the example of a new facility. In an OBC, then you, the law requires that you are now required to prepare an environmental justice impact statement. Um, before your application for permit will be reviewed. So what does this mean? So this means that you have to, um, you have to prepare the environmental justice impact statement reviewing the public health stressors and the environmental stressors that are present in the OBC. Um, you have to hold a public hearing um, and this public hearing process um, has to be within certain timeframes. Um, you have to give enough notice for the community to participate. Um, and the notice requirements are set forth in the statute, um, probably further delineated in the regulations as well. Um, you, have to get, you have to give enough time for the community to participate in the process um, and to review the materials that you're submitting, the, the state, the environmental justice impact statement, and to be able to respond to that. Um, and then once all of that is done, you will submit that to the DEP for review. Okay, so let's get into some primary definitions here. Um, facility, who is subject to this law? Which facilities? We have um, facilities that are major sources of air pollution, um, resource recovery facilities or incinerators, sludge processing facilities, combustors, um, incinerators, sewage treatment plants, transfer stations, um, or other solid waste facilities, recycling facilities, um, scrap metal facilities, landfills, medical waste incinerators. Um, those are the categories of the facilities in general the uh, exact wording of the facilities is set for in the statute. Um, and then there's a further definition here you can see for what is defined as <clears throat> major source, which is pursuant to the Clean Air Act. Um, so that's the category of facilities that we're talking about. What is an overburned community? I think it's helpful to just keep repeating these definitions again and again, because it doesn't hurt the law is a little bit confusing, um, but we talked about it earlier. And OBC means at least 35% of the households qualify as low income, at least 40% of the residents identify as minority, or 30, or it's an or, 
40% of the households have limited English proficiency. We do not have to determine as practitioners um, who is an OBC. The state will do that. They will provide a list, okay? So that's one thing we do not have to worry about. Um, all of the lists that are, all of the communities that fall within the OBCs are available at a link, okay? Um, currently with the latest data and the census data, there are 3,168 total census block groups fall into this definition. Um, and I think that amounts to, um, I think about 330 municipalities ended up receiving notices that they had, um, that they fell under an OBC, that they had locations that fell under an OBC. So, but the list is there. This is the map, the latest map um, with the latest data of overburden communities. Oops, trying to like zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Okay. So you can see that an OBC can be, it can be minority, it can be low income and minority. It can be all of them. It could be some of them. Um, but again, this is something that you do not have to determine. The state will determine who falls into this. Okay, permit. Um, permit is also pretty self-explanatory per the statute. They have a, a list of permits that fall under the EJ law um, and they are here. Um, the two exceptions are um, any authorization to uh, or approval necessary to perform site remediation pursuant to um, New Jersey's Brownfield Contaminated Site Remediation Act or any authorization or approval required for minor modification of a facility's major source permit for activities or improvements that do not increase emissions. And those are the two permit exceptions. But the full list of permits is um, available, readily available online. Okay, so the requirement for the permit applications. If upon adoption of the regs, but now we have this AO uh, executive order as well. So um, I'll get to that later. But what the statute said is upon, upon adoption of the of regulations, um, the department cannot consider any application for a new facility or the expansion um, or the expansion renewal of an existing facility if unless the unless the applicant has first prepared the environmental justice impact statement, which we discussed a little bit earlier, which I'm also going to talk a little bit about later, transmits this to the DEP and the community and holds public hearings. This is three things you just have to remember. This process requires an EJIS, Environmental Justice Impact Statement, um, sharing this with the community and holding a public hearing and submitting all this information to the DEP. There's three things you take away from this. That should be what it is. So again, I'm just re repeating some of the things I said earlier, but the department will not have discretion for a new facility if it creates a disparate impact, um, meaning that, and it's a mouthful, um, the, the approval of the permit would, as proposed, together with other environmental or Public, other public health stressors affecting the OBC cause or contribute to adverse cumulative environmental public health stressors in the OBC. It's gonna be denied for new facilities. There's no discretion in that. For the expansion of an existing facility or the renewal of an existing facility um, for the major source permit, they may they may um, review and put place conditions on it. So they don't have to deny. They can review it 
and see what can be done to minimize, and they may place conditions. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some of these definitions. What is an environmental and public health stressor? So the stakeholder process went into detail about what these could mean. So I'm just, I'm pulling a little bit from that stakeholder process um, to give you some information, but it's not, I won't be able to go into everything um, in detail the way the stakeholder process went into, um, but here's some information. It could mean, means, it does mean these categories and it could mean some other categories, um, but concentrated areas of air pollution, mobile sources of air pollution, contaminated sites, um, existing transfer station or other solid waste facilities, scrap yards, recycling facilities, um, point sources of water pollution, um, including water pollution from facilities or CSOs, okay? Um, <clears throat> or it could mean conditions that may cause potential public impacts, impacts including asthma, cancer, elevated blood, uh, lead levels, uh, cardiovascular disease, development problems in overburdened communities. Um, they also have discussed um, flooding, lack of open space, um, impervious cover, um, education, unemployment. Um, they discussed 31 potential stressors in the stakeholder process. So if this is something that this is something that you want to really get into and dive into, look at the stakeholder process for what it an environmental stressor could mean. There were 30 poten 31 potential categories. All right, I won't be able to go into detail too much on this, but I know there's probably a lot of questions about this, the geographic point of comparison. They discussed it could be the state, it could be state non overburdening communities, it could be the county, it could be a hybrid of approaches. Um, they will determine if you're gonna be at the um, the point of comparison, likely the 50th percentile. And um, if you're higher than that median point in the geographic point of comparison, so you're gonna have to compare your OBC to another location, which is not an OBC, and they will determine what that is. Um, and that's where you begin your comparison for purposes of your environmental justice statement. Okay. Um, I, I worry over that. So let me just go over quickly what the steps might look like. Is your, is your facility in an OBC? Yes? Okay, using publicly available data, mapping tools, et cetera. Is that OBC subject to environmental public health stressors that are higher than your geographic point of comparison? Okay, how do you determine that? You're gonna have to go through the list of categories that they determine you can use um, for geographic for for environmental public health stressors, and what you can use as your geographic point of comparison, and then you will prepare your environmental justice statement. If if on that scale, um, if let's say you have eighteen, this is the example that they gave at the stakeholder process, you have eighteen stressors in your OBC, and your geographic point of comparison has fifteen stressors then you have more stressors, right? Your project has more stressors. Um, so you, then you can either propose measures to eliminate or reduce those stressors. And if you cannot, then your application will be denied. Unless you fall into a compelling public interest exception as for a new facility. Okay, um, the new administrative order um, in the interim before the regulations are um, issued um, is basically saying that you need to begin to engage the community. Um, you need to hold hearings and you need to present to the community um, based on um, if you have an open, if you have an open public comment period, um, you will, um, Let's see, I have it in here. Uh, during the extended public comment period, so they're gonna extend public comment periods uh, based on this executive order that was um, just issued on September. 
uh, encourage individuals, individuals to provide information regarding existing conditions within the overburden community and potential facility-wide environmental public health stressors that could result in adverse impacts in the event of approval. So it's sort of like doing what we just talked about. Go over what are the existing conditions um, in your OBC and how the facility is going to impact the public health and environmental stressors that are already present there. Um, require the applicant to respond to and address the concerns raised by the individuals in the OBC and to conduct any additional analysis. Again, this is going back to what I first said is what's a primary goal of this EJ law is community engagement and providing the community an ability to stay engaged and, and have power in this process um, of, dis make, of decision making and where these facilities get cited. Um, strongly encourage each applicant to engage directly with the, each in, with the individuals and the OBCs. Um, and then where permits or approvals may be issued, DEP will apply such special conditions as may be necessary to minimize environmental public health stressors. All right, so I'm gonna end there and pass on the baton. Okay, hey, Ray, you there? Mr. Papperman's on the phone, so. <laughs> Ray's okay. on the phone. Okay, we, uh, <laughs> just hang on, Nikki. Thank you, Bob. I mean, we're having a, 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 an issue, a technical issue. I've got Dr. Sheets on the phone. His internet crashed. Oh, boy. So I'm trying to figure out a way. Can he call in and I can put his PowerPoint up and maybe he can just talk through it? Is we, there a way can, to do that? We can, we can definitely do that. And I can either, I can run his slides too, because I have them. <laughs> can you hear Phil said we can do that? Yep. Can you give me the phone number while we're on the phone? I'll give it to Nikki. I'm just... I'm in the middle here. I can't look at my email and do this and talk on the phone at the same now time. You're, now you're really asking for a lot. While we're doing this, um, just a, a, um, if I can throw a question out that did come in so we can keep everybody going. Um, <laughs> there were two questions that came yeah, in. Is the definition of OBC by municipality, I think that was answered or by section. And then the other one is, if there's an exemption for brownfield sites, but they add contaminated sites I maybe I as a potential category, how's that happen? So if we can, I'm going to look it up right now, Ray. Can somebody answer that? I'd rather have you go first, though. Is Bhavani still there? Did you hear that, Bhavani? Yeah. I, I could jump in. I'll go, go ahead, Bhavani. No, go ahead. No, I was just saying the law doesn't specifically exempt brownfield sites, but it question. does exempt or, or any permits related to a site remediation. Which could be anything under, you know, what is your phone uh, number? You know, the sanitation program or any uh, other moderate. permit related to a, a cleanup. So, mm -hmm. um, if you're doing a cleanup of any sort and have any permit related to that cleanup, okay. it is not such a go. to I'm um, give him your phone number. I'm tell of him to the call EJ you law. to tell you how to get on, and he'll be the one running the show. So, all right, thanks. Bye. Hopefully, that answered the question. Phil. Yep. Can you, I have Nikki's phone number. Can you give him a call and tell him how to get on on the telephone? And then you can talk to him and work his PowerPoint while he speaks. Okay, why don't we do that? And there's another question just came up if you guys want to answer that while I call Nikki. Okay, let me give you the phone number first. 609. Yeah. Nobody listen to this. 609. 558-4987. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. And if you can get this done while we're answering questions, fine. Otherwise, Ray, I'm going to probably have you go before Nikki. Okay. All right. The other, and the other question just came up. Do practitioners use US EPA EJAC screen? So I'm going to mute myself and call Nikki. Somebody want to take that question? If Bobby's not jumping up, uh, I'll just jump in. Uh, uh, the EJ, uh, EPA's EJ screening is just one of the considerations that DEP is looking at to determine which stressors um, they're going to, you know, employ or not. I don't think they're going to use EJ screen um, specifically for uh, how you get through this process, but I know DEP uh, is looking at that as far as maybe a basis or as instructive of what they're going to come up with. Okay, Phil is on the. I didn't see any other questions in the in the chat. I don't know if anybody else did. Um, and we were going to hold questions till the end anyway. I'm I'm thinking maybe 
um, Ray, we go out of order. I would have preferred to have uh, Nikki uh, go uh, first. If, if, if you want me to, I will. Well, just so we don't run out of time. Um, Fine. So I'm now going to try and, well, do you want to introduce me first and I'll try and share my screen? Yes, I'll introduce you. And if, if somehow <laughs> Phil comes back before I finish your introduction, we'll go to Nikki. And, Sorry, and I everybody. Maybe Phil to share my screen as well. So let, go ahead. Bhavani, are you there? Bobby? I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I have a bit of if, Sorry, if, yeah. Ray need, if Ray needs help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Do the intro first. Uh, yes. Bear with me. Okay. Uh, Ray Cantor is Vice President of Government Affairs of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, the NJBIA the nation's largest state-level business association whose member companies collectively employ a million people. Ray uh, is an attorney whose career has included high-level positions in the legislative and executive branches of government, a former assistant commissioner and later chief advisor to the commissioner of the DEP. He leads the NJBIA's advocacy efforts on environmental and energy matters affecting the business community. At the DEP, Ray oversaw the offices of legal affairs, dispute resolution, one of my offices, and economic analysis, in addition to advising the DP Commissioner on policy, legal management, and economic matters. Ray was also responsible for policy formulation related to all DEP regulations, including site remediation, NRD, national resource, <coughs> excuse me, air quality, water regulation, and land use management. Um, Ray's experience as a business lobbyist also includes five years as Director of Government Affairs for the Medical Society of New Jersey, and then Executive Director of the New Jersey Apartment Association. He returned to the, to the state DP in 2010. As I said before, he was Chief Advisor to Commissioner Martin for eight years. Um, Ray is representing the interest of the business community. Our natural flow is going to have Nikki Sheets, who represents the EJ community, uh, speaking then Ray. So we're going to inverse that a little bit. Ray, take it away. Uh, we hope. Uh, last chance for Nikki. Bill? He hasn't, he hasn't called in yet, so let's, uh, let's, let's start going. Well, so, uh, before Ray starts, were you able to work out how he could call in? Yes, he's calling in right now. Let's hope it works. Okay. Well, in light of time, let's just go, Ray. Okay. Uh, I'm going go. to try and share my screen. You Let's got see. it. Did that work? Yes, it did. Perfect. Did do... Wow. Perfect for you. I can't see it. Just do the um, slideshow. Oh, that's right. I got to do the slideshow. Let's see if that works then. Let the slideshow, the fourth one in. The... No? no? That's reading view. I'm sorry. Slideshow. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Perfect. Um, but, um, hi, everyone. Uh, again, Ray introduced me. Um, I, I work for the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, so my uh, uh, talk will really focus on what the business community's concerns were with the law, uh, EJ law that passed, uh, and what our concerns are now that we're in the regulatory process and moving forward. Um, I was hoping to uh, listen to Nikki first so I could respond to uh, you know, his comments as an advocate for this law. It was really Nikki and the EJ community advocates who I think were largely responsible for uh, getting this through the uh, legislature, um, but we will move on anyway. Let's see if I can change slides. Okay, uh, three key points I just really wanna make uh, in, in my presentation. Um, you know, This law from our perspective really does not address the real issues that are facing uh, these communities. Um, we'll, we'll see if Nikki uh, agrees with that or not. Um, but more importantly, from the business community perspective, it creates uncertainty in the regulatory process. And we believe long-term it's gonna harm the economic uh, uh, progress you know, in New Jersey, economic uh, environment in New Jersey. And we believe it's gonna do that and have that negative impact even outside of overburdened communities. So let me talk about the problems with the underlying law. Uh, I don't want to spend much time on the first point. It, it's a much more philosophical point. But um, while we recognize that there are absolute areas in the state that have uh, significant environmental and other problems, stressors, if you like, 
uh, plus other challenges, um, we largely reject the premise of the law that those conditions were purposely done, at, at least not in New Jersey. Um, you know, uh, areas such as Newark and Camden, and you know, you know, other you know EJ areas, you know, a, as defined, uh, were, were largely factory towns that grew up with, uh, you know, immigrants from Eastern Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, as time went on, a lot of those industries closed or changed hands. The demographics of those towns changed and were left with legacy pollution and existing industries. And our appreciation and our tolerance for uh, what in the early 20th century was thought to be good uh, areas, you know, we now seem to uh, recognize those as major pollution sources and areas that uh, cause health impacts. But I don't think the conditions today largely were purposeful. Um, and we also think there are other ways we could address this problem you know, in, in EJ communities. I mentioned the CCI program that DEP has in place, the Community Collaborative Initiative. And that is a program that uh, goes into certain areas. Um, and it identifies real problems that communities are facing and, and it addresses those problems. I'll, I'll give a couple for instances. Uh, in Camden, uh, DEP recognized that there were areas of the town where during uh, any type of storm, even mild rainfall, the um, sewer drains would, would uh, backflow and the streets would flood and kids uh, going to school basically had to walk through uh, dirty water in order to get to school. Unacceptable situation, we went in or DEP went in and they solved that problem. Um, you know. Uh, again, solving a real issue for a real community. Uh, the Harrison landfill in, in Camden was uh, closed with an influx of money from DEP as now being turned into a beautiful um, Riverside Park. The same thing with, um, uh, with, with Newark where uh, the Passaic River waterfront, you know, received an uh, inf infusion of money from DEP and together with other sources is now gonna be uh, a world-class waterfront park, and that's being done elsewhere. So there are other ways to really improve these areas and address pollution concerns without this broad viewpoint of looking at all industries or, or many industries and saying uh, no, or um, uh, th these things are, are no longer acceptable in these areas. Um, it was mentioned before what the definition of an overburdened community is, and I just want to mention that it, it, it's not related to the environmental conditions of those communities. It's a broad definition based on socioeconomic conditions. Again, it was mentioned minority status, English speaking, poverty levels. And while uh, those may be areas of concern, that you know, uh, they're not necessarily uh, you know, overburdened per se. That's what this law you know, gets to. But, you know, as mentioned, it's about 3,400 census tracts in the state of New Jersey in 330 some odd municipalities, including areas like, like Princeton and Alpine that you would not think of uh, as areas in need of uh, protection. And it includes about two thirds of the population of the state. You take out the highlands and the pylons, um, you know, it, it's a lot of what is, is left after that. Um, the law ignores some of the economic benefits that industry uh, brings to communities. I do not at all want to make the argument that towns uh, or communities should accept uh, pollution levels or you know, uh, facilities in the communities that are inappropriate or that are harmful, but let's not ignore the fact that in order to improve these areas, it's not just uh, you know, the truck traffic or the environmental conditions. Uh, good paying jobs with health benefits also provides excellent benefits to communities. It helps keeps families together. It helps um, uh, bring uh, back uh, supermarkets to areas. So there are lots of things you know, that are good for communities beyond what this EJ law is considering and none of those things are being addressed or even acknowledged in this law. And from our perspective, um, you know, this law creates a good deal of uncertainty. Uh, one of our major concerns, and I'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the AO, is that um, you know, we're concerned that politics may be brought into uh, this arena. Whenever you have a regulatory program, 
and you go out to public comment, um, and the public will say, we don't want this for whatever reason, we don't want this. We think it's unsightly. We think it could be uh, uh, unattractive. We don't want the trucks, et cetera. From a normal environmental regulatory perspective, um, the regulators will say, thank you very much for those comments, but we look at standards. Does it meet our standards? Um, does it meet the air pollution safety factors, the uh, water factors, you know, everything else that goes into making sure that the environment and public health are protected and they'll make the decisions based on that. We're concerned that we were concerned that this just opens up the avenue to um, community outrage of, of not wanting something without bringing firm standards that can be applied. Um, so uh, again, it, it creates uncertainty. The time process here, you know, again, we're now doing public hearings. We're now having a longer process. Um, while um, I, I think we, we as a business community uh, are fa in favor of more process and in community engagement, it does increase you know, that time period. And with, in any business decision, time is also money, which gets to the next part about cost. Um, this is obviously going to increase costs, and that may be fine. Um, but sometimes those costs are uncertain. We don't know what conditions are going to be uh, required of facilities. We don't know what um, you know, analyses they're necessarily going to have to do. So you, you, you now have more uncertainty as to the key business decisions of any uh, facility development. What are the time and cost to get this done? Which the next part, uh, um, you know, what are the standards? Uh, it, it, I think the EP is largely going to fix this when they do their regulations and how they determine disproportionate impact. But, you know, in the normal sense, in the normal course of a, a, a regulatory program, you'll have a permit level. You'll know uh, what the air pollution standards are in that area or what your discharge limits, you know, can be. And you'll make a decision, can we meet that or not? Can we meet that or not in a cost-effective manner? And the business will now make that uh, determination. But again, not knowing what the time cost and the standards are, it makes it much more difficult to do that. And you may see businesses walking away. And our major concern is beyond new facilities coming in, which we would like, but you know, which may uh, don't happen that often in New Jersey uh, for a lot of these types of facilities. Um, or expansions as well, uh, we're really concerned about renewals. And renewals in this bill only apply to um, those major sources of air pollution, which are really Title V facilities. There's about 240 of them uh, out there. Historically, uh, if you were permitted, uh, you were grandfathered, and you knew you had to meet those standards you know, going forward. What this bill now does is change the rules of the game after these facilities have been built, permitted, and have literally invested millions or tens of millions, in some cases, over $100 million in their facility. Now, every five years, the process is reopened. And we don't, while the law says that DEP cannot deny a permit, we don't know if DEP will condition that permit to such an extent where it may be in a an effective denial. We don't know if the EP under this law can tell a facility, cut back your hours of operation, stop producing certain lines of uh, products because we don't like the materials that you are using. So there's a good, the EP, by the way, is saying they're not going to do that. But when this law was crafted and as it's drafted right now, we don't know for certain that that is going to be the end result. So all that uncertainty from politics, from time, cost, standards, and especially with the renewals, may lead to an environment where people, uh, facilities may not even try to locate or expand or continue their business in, in New Jersey. Um, again, uncertainty is not good uh, from a business perspective. Um, so, so let me jump into the premise of the EJ law, uh, again, which I know what was covered but let me talk about it from, from our perspective. Um, you know, it, it really encourages community engagement and we think that is good. 
we always encourage our businesses to be good neighbors. And many of them, or maybe most of, of the major facilities are uh, good neighbors. They, they engage with the community, they have, they have local uh, community groups that they actively work with. Um, so we think that is all good. Public hearings are also good. Giving more information about stressors is, is also very good. Um, a lot of times communities are concerned because they don't know what's going on. They don't know what the facts are or there may be mis, uh, misinformation about what's going on in the facility or what may be coming into the community. So we think it's really essential, even before you decide to come into an area or before you decide to expand, engage the community, get the facts out, uh, and we think those are good things. It can all go too far, but we think these are good things you know, in, in this law. Uh, uh, it, the law also gets into disproportionate impact, and that's really the premise for all DEP decision-making. So once you get past the EGIS, you know, the Environmental Justice Impact Statement, once you get past the process, DEP's decision-making is all based on disproportionate impact. Does one area have more stressors than uh, another area? And we'll talk in a second about you know, where that comparison is. Um, so it, it does, it's not a health-based standard. Um, and I'm not sure if, if we can actually do that either, either. And we get to talk more about that maybe in, in the question period. But this law does not say, here's what is safe from an air pollution perspective to be in a certain area. Here's what is safe when you add up you know, all these stressors in an area and uh, to make sure that no one's gonna get asthma or whatever else it is, it doesn't go toward the specific health or environmental benefits. And all it does is add up stressors and compare it to other areas. Uh, while that may be simplistic and we like the simplicity of that, uh, people should not be fooled that this is an environmentally based health standard law. And again, as I mentioned, it, does not address a lot of the, uh, existing problems uh, largely because again, it does get toward those renewals of those major facilities, which we think are problematic, but it doesn't address all the other areas that programs like CCI, I mentioned that do. Um, but again, I I'm sure Nikki would mention, I'm sure DEP here would mention, this is, this is just one tool and a larger toolbox. And there are many other things that can uh, go on and should go on to improve these areas. Um, how am I doing time-wise, by the way, folks? I'd say you gotta move it along, right? <laughs> I'm trying to move it along, so I'm gonna move it along. So um, uh, the geographic point of comparison, uh, we, we think it, it, it is central. What are you comparing to what? When uh, the law was being uh, negotiated, uh, we uh, were very concerned that if you compare it the ironbound in Newark to Hutterling County, of course you're gonna find the ironbound to have a disproportionate impact. Um, so, uh, and, and therefore, you know, you may not be able to put new things there or expand, you know, et cetera. So, you know, we think that geographic point of comparison is important. We should be comparing, um, you know, areas, you know, maybe within the county to each other or maybe areas within the region to each other, but you should not be comparing the Highlands to Camden and, and saying, oh, 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 what one is obviously more stressed than the other uh, from that perspective. Be, uh, and, and DEP in the stakeholder meetings and their initial analysis, um, they're th basically saying that 90% of OBCs are automatically going to be de de deemed to be uh, you know, disproportionately impact. So the definition of an OBC almost automatically makes them you know, disproportionately impact. And we don't think that's really what the law was intended. Um, uh, again, it was mentioned before how you determine a disproportionate impact. Uh, uh, we, we think it's good that DEP is going to be looking at stressors and adding those up. We think there are other ways they could have done that, but what they're not doing, and uh, again, we don't think you can do this, is trying to do a cumulative impact of if you add up all the stressors together, what that means from a health perspective. The science is not there to do that. I know the advocates would like that to be done. I don't think we necessarily would, would object to that if the science were there, the science is not there. Again, we're looking for a predictable um, 
cost effective regulatory process and we think the EP you know is moving into the into that area I'll, I'll just mention a, a couple of things uh, the bill allows um, conditions to be uh, placed on uh, new uh, excuse me on uh, expanded or renewed facilities uh, we don't know what those are uh, uh, again DEP says they're going to be reasonable you know in doing that and try and reduce uh, stressors and areas and we are largely supportive of, of that direction that's where the department is going we have concerns that uh, uh, that the bill provides that or the law provides that uh, new facilities have to be denied if there's a disproportionate impact and again since 90 percent of OBCs are going to be disproportionate uh, it's going to prevent any new facility from going into those areas even if it has a good uh, you know a benefit uh, we also want the regulations to be as detailed as possible so we can avoid those political considerations and base those determinations on um, objective criteria that, that is in the regulations. We don't want subjective or political decisions to be made. Ray, uh, like another, are, minute, another minute? Uh, sure, uh, again, uh, just to mention, okay, we have concerns that this is gonna have a chilling effect on businesses with the uncertainty uh, that this uh, law provides, and unless the EP clarifies it, um, you know, it, it's going to deter businesses from expanding, from locating, and it may even uh, force facilities to who are already here. Um, problems with the AO, it, it was mentioned, uh, uh, the AO now tries to implement the law before the law says it should be implemented, so that it's a direct contravention to the law. It prejudges the process. Um, you know, there's a lot of devil in the details, and this is applying a very general AO before those details are worked out. Um, and um, uh, again, we think the AO also goes far beyond the law's um, ability. So that was really quick. And um, I, I look forward to the Q&A uh, provision. And then, I'll, and then Mickey gets to follow me, which is not fair, but that's okay. Okay, th thank you, Ray. Um, we, we've, had, we've had some technical difficulties and working behind the scenes to get to get Dr. Sheets back on. I understand he is back on. In fact, I see your face, Dr. Sheets. Uh, um, I don't know if you got to hear much of what Ray had to say, but I'm gonna assume you can, yeah. you can, you, <laughs> that you have an idea of what he said um, <laughs> yeah. from prior activity. So thank you, Ray. I have a couple of questions, but we're gonna hold questions off until the speakers are, are, are finished. Um, let me introduce Dr. Sheets. Um, Dr. Sheets is the director of the Center for the Urban Environment of the John S. Watson Institute for Public Policy at Kane University. The primary mission of the center is providing support for the environmental justice community. Dr. Sheets is a founding member of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, the EJ Leadership Forum on Climate Change, the EJ and Science Initiative, and an informal EJ Attorneys Group. Dr. Sheets has been appointed to several federal and state advisory councils, including the EPA's National EJ Advisory Council, the EPA's Clean Air Act Advisory Committee, and the New Jersey Clean Air Council. He earned his BA from Princeton University uh, and a law degree and PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Harvard University. Um, doc, Dr. Sheets heard, I don't know if, how much I heard of Ray in the business community. He's represented the EJ community for years. And without further ado, take it away, Dr. Sheets. So what I heard, and uh, Verizon had an outage. So I'm actually lucky because they sent a message saying the internet wouldn't be up until 3.30. <laughs> uh, but they got it up faster. So I heard the first, first five minutes of Bobany's um, presentation and the last five minutes of Ray's. So um, let me just pull up my PowerPoint. And um, can everybody see that? Can you see that, Ray? Got it. Looks good. And I'll go through my PowerPoint. It may not be responsive to what other folks said, but I uh, don't know how long we'll, we'll have for questions now, but we'll do the best we can here. Okay, so um, thanks for inviting me to do this. What I will talk about is, and I'm turning my timer on, Ray. Um, I'll talk about uh, cumulative impacts 
And that's really what the law addresses. It addresses environmental justice, but in particular, it addresses uh, the issue of cumulative impacts. And I'll talk about from an EJ perspective why we thought the law is needed, uh, some of the history behind, um, behind cumulative impacts in New Jersey, and then make some comments about the law, the regulations um, itself. So uh, Ray already said this, I, I think for full disclosure, I'm, I'm a member of the EJ grassroots community. And one of my main functions is to try to use my legal and scientific background to help the EJ community uh, develop the best possible public policy from an EJ perspective. So about half my work is state and local and about half is national. And I am currently serving on the White House Environmental Justice um, Advisory Council that advises um, the White House, really advise CEQ, the Council on Environmental Quality. So let's jump into the issue of cumulative impacts. It is probably uh, the premier environmental justice issue uh, today and has been for a long time. Here is a formal definition of cumulative impacts. Uh, cumulative impacts are the risk and impacts caused by multiple pollutants. And usually these pollutants are emitted by multiple sources of pollution in a neighborhood. So the risk and impacts caused by these pollutants, both individually and when they interact with each other and with any social vulnerabilities that exist in a neighborhood. And as I said, it's been a problem for, well, from an EJ perspective, um, it's been a problem for forever since the beginning of the EJ movement, kind of started the EJ movement, and it's been very hard to address. And one of the reasons it's been hard to address is because how we try to, typically how we try to address pollution in our country is we go pollutant by pollutant and we set a standard. So we set individual standards for pollutants. The problem is, at least from the EJ perspective, is that even if no individual standard is violated, you can still have detrimental health impacts by the pollution because the individual standards are not taking into account the total amount of pollution in a neighborhood, not the soup of pollution that can be in a neighborhood. Because um, think about it, when, when you breathe in air, it's not like you have partitions in your lungs and the uh, particulate matter goes to one part of your lungs and the uh, nitrogen oxides go to another and you, you get the idea. They're all mixed up in our lungs, but we haven't taken account uh, of that typically um, under, under the law. And here's another uh, issue with cumulative impacts, and that is the correlation between pollution, uh, race, and income in our state and in our country. Uh, here's a, uh, here are figures I've shown all over the country. I actually think Ray Papperman, at least, and Bobney's seen them before, apologies, but I, I get teased because I show it so much. But uh, I, I think it, it shows why we have an environmental justice movement. And it, these figures were developed by New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection in 2009. So it was using uh, late 1990s data, early 2000s data. And DEP, the first thing they did was they assigned a relative cumulative impact score to every neighborhood in New Jersey, every block group in New Jersey. In this instance, you can think of the definition of cumulative impacts as a very rough estimate of the total amount of pollution uh, in New Jersey neighborhoods. And then uh, they wanted to see what the relationship was between uh, cumulative impacts, the amount of pollution in the neighborhood, and race and income. So they graphed it. And uh, they came up with the, um, with the relationship you see on the screen, which today I'll just call, call it a very disturbing relationship. Uh, depending on how I feel, I may call it a wholly disturbing, but it's at least disturbing. Look at the top figure. Uh, you'll see there's a number of people of color living in a New Jersey neighborhood increases, so does the estimate of cumulative impacts. And it's the same thing, look at the bottom figure, and it's the same thing for people living in poverty. As a number of impoverished people living in community, uh, the estimate of cumulative impacts pollution uh, uh, goes up, almost a linear relationship. They didn't do fancy statistics on it, but I think the figures stand for themselves. And I, I'll, I'll say uh, today what I've said all across the country, what this is providing you evidence of is that if you live in New Jersey, uh, the amount of pollution in your neighborhood is connected to race and income, the color of your skin and the amount of money in your pocket. And that goes against everything that at least we claim we stand for in the state and in the country. And I'll say it's not just New Jersey. If other states did, did this, they would probably find something very similar. 
because the EJ movement, uh, one of the things that started it back in the 1980s were national studies that showed similar relationship on the national level. So, uh, you know, this relationship that we always talk about in the EJ movement, and it was uh, good to get kind of confirmation that what we were talking about was actually happening. And, you know, we determined that we needed to develop some policies to address um, this relationship. And look, what we're worried about, the EJ communities are on your right, you know, EJ for environmental justice. They're the communities of color and the low income communities. And you can see there's, a, there's an estimated disproportionate amount of pollution in these communities. And of course, what we're worried about is that this disproportionate amount of pollution in communities of color and low income communities is one reason why we have persistent health disparities um, that are rooted in race and income in our country. And so we felt we just, you, you need to address this. It's unfair and unhealthy. So here's a history of cumulative impacts from um, an EJ perspective in the state. And uh, George, you said that you went to Camden and got out and uh, you could, you know, Camden, you could smell it, right? <laughs> you could smell something in the air. And uh, we kind of had a similar experience. Uh, I still remember when I first came back to the state after graduate school, um, uh, DEP had actually proposed a rule uh, on cumulative impacts, but they deep sixed it for some reason, don't know why. And I distinctly remember we were sitting in a New Jersey EJ Alliance meeting, I think it was 2007. And we said, and we were in Camden and we said, you know, the state's not gonna do anything about this. Doesn't look like it right now. So we gotta do something. So we formed our first cumulative impacts com committee in 2008, New Jersey EJ Alliance and, and allies, Unbound Community Cor Corp Corporation, Environmental Federation, EELC. And we started working, uh, working on the issue. And you can, you can read some of the history here. Um, I'll, take you, I'll take you back up to, oh, well, let me first say, we started, and let me go back to the history. We developed um, two policies, one on the state level and one on, on the municipal level. Um, our state level um, policy goes back to 2011. And um, here it is, I'll talk briefly about it. What it says, and this is New Jersey EJ Alliance state level cumulative impacts policy. What it says is identify EJ or overburdened communities or maybe and overburdened communities. And there is a distinction in which I can talk about. Uh, and when you uh, identify them, protect them from new sources of pollution by saying you're not gonna give any more major new pollution permits in those communities, unless they can show they're not gonna increase pollution in that neighborhood. You're gonna reduce pollution by saying that if your pollution permit, if you have a pollution permit and it comes up for renewal, then uh, if you, you're not gonna get renewal unless you can show you're gonna decrease pollution in that neighborhood. And we're gonna provide quality of life incentives. That's a euphemism for money so that uh, we can ensure that there'll be green space, affordable food in the neighborhood and try to attract non-polluting industry. Now we advocated for this policy for years and didn't get um, much headway until in 2017, Senator Booker uh, came to us with an EJ bill on the national level. It did not have cumulative impacts in it. So we said, well, any EJ bill needs cumulative impacts in it. And we gave them our statewide policy and it was, that statewide policy was, um, was uh, incorporated into the bill in, alter, in an altered fo format. Uh, didn't quite go as far as ours, as you know, our statewide policy, but, but um, you know, pretty, pretty much, not quite the same, but pretty much incorporated um, um, as, as it was. And this was in, in 2017 and the cumulative impacts part of that bill was incorporated into a bill from um, the House of Representatives uh, in 2019, uh, submitted in 2020. So both of these bills were uh, submitted, uh, not uh, adopted, and we didn't expect them to be adopted at that time, but we hoped it would influence what was happening on the state level. And in fact, C Senator Singleton uh, uh, knew about this bill and we think influenced influence him to bring the New Jersey legislation that was ultimately adopted. And it's important to note that this legislation had been brought before, uh, way back, I think it was back in 2012, 
but had not been adopted. So Singleton, Sing Singleton revived it. And uh, I say, again, I think influenced by the national work and uh, in, revived it back in 2018. And we worked with him since then. And he's a hero of ours. I said the, uh, this, our statewide policy was um, incorporated into those national bills in, in an altered form. And, and um, look, we are, and Ray actually, Cantor actually said this for me, um, you know, we, we think there's a great need for this bill, uh, for the health of these communities, for fairness. If you're gonna have any sense of fairness, we think uh, this bill is, is needed. It's been the holy grail of the EJ movement for forever, but we understand it's not a silver bullet. So this bill is not gonna address all the uh, cumulative impact concerns in EJ communities. Uh, it's, you're gonna need other strategies and other laws um, uh, it, we've come to say you're going to need cumulative policies to address cumulative impacts. One, one type of policy you need uh, is going to be climate change mitigation policy, which we've been advocating climate change mitigation policy be used not only to fight climate change, but also to address cumulative impacts. But that's a presentation for another day. Um, talk a little bit about the bill itself. I, I, I didn't hear most of what uh, Bobney said. So let me just highlight areas that I think are, are important. Um, the bill defines what it calls overburdened communities. These are really environmental justice communities. And the reason I say that is because it only uses social demographic indicators to define what these communities are. There are no environmental indicators in the definition of um, these communities. So it really defines environmental justice communities. And then the environmental part comes in though, uh, if and when a facility wants to move into one of these um, communities. And I heard Ray in the last time talk about disproportionate impact. Well, that's right. But what the bill actually says, I'm sure um, Bobney said this, is that uh, uh, if you want to get a pollution permit Right, major pollution permit in one of these overburdened communities or EJ communities, then you got to do an EJ analysis. Um, that, and, and if that EJ analysis shows the cumulative public health or environmental stresses are higher in the block group where the proposed facility will be located than in other block groups, then if it's a new permit, and, and that's the key, it says if it will be higher. And if the EJ analysis finds that it is higher, then that's deemed to be a disproportionate impact. And you know, if it's higher uh, and you ask for a new permit, that shall be denied. If you're asking for a permit for an expansion and, and renewal, then um, you can, it won't be denied, but conditions can be placed on it. And rules are gonna be promulgated soon, right? We're waiting for them to come out that will implement the law. And so here, here are areas that we think are, um, are important to the rules. Um, and uh, you know, I, I didn't hear all of Bobney's um, presentation, but one thing is that even if there's a finding that stress will be higher in the community in which the facility will be located in other communities, uh, there is still an exception where the permit would not be denied if the facility serves a compelling public interest and the rules will define that. And from an EJ perspective, we think that needs to be defined very narrowly because if it's defined too large, it, it can eat up the whole bill. Or if it's defined in a manner where you, you, you know, you're you're testing um, where almost anything can be a compelling public interest, then it, it defeats the purpose of the bill. Um, so you know, we've suggested that it really should be defined in a way that um, is just several things: um, um, municipal scale food food waste composting facilities, public water infrastructure, sediment treatment plants. Um, and, and nothing else should qualify. And you know, the heart of the bill will be how do you, how do you, how do you uh, determine if stresses are higher? And um, we won't go down, we won't go down that rabbit hole because <laughs> that's a big rabbit hole right now. But um, Ray alluded to it, they're gonna, they're gonna count up uh, how many stressors are higher in the community in question than in other communities. 
um, if it exceeds a 50th percentile it would cons uh, of, of other communities, non overburdened communities, stresses in those communities would be considered higher. We actually suggested that they, we, the EJ community, actually suggested that they do a cumulative impact score, overall cumulative impact score. That's how they do it in California. And that California tool has been vetted extensively. Um, but we understand why they did it this way. And you know, we, we, we wanna make suggestions to, from the EJ perspective, how to make that work better. Uh, and, and I think Ray Cantor, in this case, did identify you know, an important issue. What's gonna be the geographic unit of comparison? And, and we urge, and we hope they do this. We think that unlike what Ray was saying, we think the, we think the geographic unit of comparison should be um, uh, the overburdened, the, the non-overburdened communities in New Jersey, because that's, that's what you want, the Huntington counties, the other counties that are considered non-overburdened, that's what you want to bring all New Jersey to. And, and we think that's the fairest point of comparison. Uh, you shouldn't compare one polluted part of the state to another polluted part of the state because you're trying to reduce the pollution and improve the health in those communities. Those communities have a right to have uh, uh, just as good an environment as, as the non-overburdened um, non uh, communities in the state have. We think that's a basic fundamental point, point, um, uh, point of fairness. And, and Ray talked about not being a, uh, a health standard. Well, look, we, we know again that the uh, health in communities of color and low-income communities is not as good as in other communities. Death rates are higher, pollution is higher, and we need to do something about that. Um, and we know how to do a, uh, a total cumulative impact score. That's been done for a while. It's not strictly health-based, but if you wait for for it to be strictly health-based, uh, you're gonna lose a lot of people to death and illness like you're doing now. And we make the argument and we think it's true that um, these communities deserve to be protected. That's the purpose, part of the purpose of the Department of Environmental Protection. And, 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 and you know, what we've been telling uh, scientists at both the EPA and the Department of Environmental Protection is that look, if you do nothing, and you don't try to do something about cumulative impacts because you think the science is not there and you don't know what happens when you put stressors together, you're making a scientific decision. What you're saying is that that pollution is not interacting, right? By doing nothing, you are actually making a scientific decision and you're making it to the detriment of uh, the health of people in those communities. And this might add, might add cost uh, to, to uh, facilities that are already in communities, but it should, because those costs are not being borne by those communities, by those facilities now, right? You have ex externalities that are not being borne by those facilities that should be borne by those facilities. And the last thing I'll say, I don't usually say this, but I will in this case, I think it's pertinent. I wanna go back to um, to this figure. Look, what's happening right now is that to the extent that our current system is sustainable, and we know overall it's not, but to the extent it's sustainable for anyone, the reason why it's sustainable for those communities on the left-hand side of your screen right, that don't have a disproportionate pollution burden. The, the, the system is sustainable because of the environmental injustices that are being borne by the communities of color and low-income communities. That's what makes it sustainable for everybody else to the extent that it's now sustainable. Because if you live in one of those other communities on the left side of your screen, you don't have to see the pollution. Uh, you don't, at least you don't have to live with it. So the system is sustainable for you somewhat sustainable at least. But if you live in one of those communities on the right-hand side of your screen, like in Newark, there's 88% of color, 
so you can see where that, where that lies. The system's not sustainable for you. So right now, the sustainability of our system, to whatever degree it is sustainable, is being born on the backs of those EJ communities. And that's not right. And I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Sheets. Um, well, we first heard from Bob and he sort of laying the predicate for the law. We heard from Ray and Dr. Sheets about their the respective uh, positions of the EJ community and the business community. And uh, I spoke with Phil. He's graciously given us a few more minutes for Q&A uh, if need be. But let me start off by saying, I think I mentioned earlier that, uh, well, first of all, everybody's given us a lot to think about. And, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, the regs are taking a long time to be uh, uh, prepared, uh, to be proposed. And I think we can see that, um, I think the word uncertainty was underlined by both uh, Ray Cantor and, and Nikki Sheets. Um, there's a lot for the DEP to consider and people are waiting to see. We had hoped to have regulations to comment on, but you can see the uncertainty that's going into what those regulations will, will say and to what extent they will. And this in an area where only a certain amount, as everybody has commented, of uh, pollution is being covered, only what's covered under the act for certain facilities. So my first question is with regard to that uncertainty, uh, Ray, um, you had mentioned that with regard to renewals, um, there was uh, uncertainty, but that you had heard back from the DEP. Were you referring to hearing back during the stakeholder process or have you heard something since the stakeholder process? Well, as mentioned, there was a very robust stakeholder process, you know, over a year, numerous um, public processes. Sean Moriarty, who has been Deputy Commissioner Moriarty, who's been leading uh, that stakeholder process. Also, I assume he did for, for, for Nikki's uh, folks, you know, and, and groups as well, had, ouch, uh, had, had separate meetings, you know, where we were able to uh, banter, uh, banter back and forth and ask questions. Um, so based on all of that, um, you know, we've been assured by the EP and we'll see, but again, nothing is certain until the regs come out that they're going to take a reasonable approach that they're not going to, um, shut down facilities, you know, um, you know, e even by taking draconian measures that they're not going to tell you to cut back your hours, et cetera. Uh, again, um, we don't know how the regs are going to come out. That's what we've been told throughout this whole stakeholder process, either publicly or privately. Okay. Um, so you haven't, because I've been advised by the DEP that while they're cr creating these regulations, they don't want to comment on those regulations. Um, so we won't know un until they come out, I suppose. Um, anyway, Phil, were there any questions in the, uh, in the chat? The question that came in was, will this not promote expansion of industry to sensitive areas like the highlands or the pinelands and result in more abandoned industry properties, industrial properties in urban areas? I assume that is a question that came up during Nikki's um, discussion about what the point of comparison should be. That's correct. Um, okay. Dr. Sheets or, or Ray or Bob, any, anybody want to? Uh, well, look, and I'm, I, I am speaking as Nikki Sheets now, not as the EJ movement, because the EJ movement says that um, pollution needs to be reduced everywhere, right? Not just equalized. That's why we don't call it environmental equity. We call it environmental justice. But at some point, you get so frustrated that things keep, get, keep uh, being put in the same communities, Right, as, as, as those figures from DEP showed, that at some point you say, look, you can't use these communities as sacrifice zones. If facilities need to be instituted for the good of the state, then all of the state should bear the cost. Not, not just some communities should bear the cost, um, but all communities should bear the cost. And, and that means going to other areas and that's what should be done. But society has to come to grips with that. That's what I mean. Right now it's sustainable because we don't have to make those hard choices. 
But so, and the law doesn't say that you can't do these facilities, right? It just says that in certain areas we're going to protect them more. You uh, won't uh, protect uh, other areas. You can. Uh, let me just right. go out there so everyone understands. Makes this distinction. There are eight facilities, types of facilities that are covered. Um, most of those facilities, number two through seven or eight, whatever it is, um, are uh, public type facilities, solid waste facilities, recycling, you know, uh, uh, wastewater plants. Uh, that's a whole different, from my perspective, it's a whole different conversation as to where they should go, should not go. Um, I I'm more interested in category one, which are, uh, you know, the, uh, the private sector, uh, you know, uh, major source of air pollution, who, mm. by the way, do, do meet standards. Um, I don't think they're going to go to the highlands or the pylons because I don't think the highlands or the pylons uh, will allow those type of facilities, you know, to, to go there. And if you take out the highlands and the pylons, you take out, uh, you know, all the overburdened communities as defined in this act, uh, there's not a lot of places for anything new to come in um, or maybe even to expand, you know, it, so, again, uh, I would rather have had a different conversation about new facilities because I, I, I think they can be benefits to communities. But the way this bill is structured, new facilities have to be denied and expansions of existing facilities uh, have an uncertain future. And, you know, those companies may decide to expand in uh, North Carolina or Delaware and not in New Jersey. Hmm. So, so Ray said something very interesting there. You know, what he, notice what he said? They won't go in the highlands in those communities because they won't be allowed there. Right. There you go. And right. where will they be allowed? They're allowed in communities of color and low-income communities that don't have the political power to stop them and whose lives have been devalued by our society. So just, uh, George, let me just say one thing first, then we'll go to George Berkowitz's question. So one of, one of the things that I see here, and, and Nikki, you mentioned earlier, the nexus between climate change mitigation and EJ, I see, depending on what comes out with these regulations, a real potential friction with existing laws. And you just mentioned two of them, the highlands, the pinelands, depending on how, how far they go. There's gonna be a friction developed, I, I see, between how far we go with EJ, and if it expands at some point, be, you know, outside of just the facilities that are noticed under, under the existing EJ law and other laws. I mean, how do we, how do we resolve that? potential conflict. Well, here, here, here's what I, I've come to believe. I, I think maybe our greatest hope in actually solving the pollution problem, how do you reduce it everywhere, comes from the EJ communities. Because now the choice we've made is we don't have to really make a choice, Ray. You know, we don't have to make the hard choice you're talking about between laws. We just put it in the EJ communities. Hmm. So now hmm. if you can't put it in the EJ communities, now, yeah, we're going to have to make those hard choices and say, okay, now that we can't just dump it in the EJ community so we don't have to think about it anymore, now what are we going to do? Maybe we'll actually get to a point where we reduce pollution for everybody if we can't just put it in the poor and black and brown communities. What about the flip side of the argument, Ray Cantor, where there are potential benefits to siting that you noted, um, siting facilities in EJ community? Or EJ communities areas. don't believe that. The, you know, the people that say that are the folks arguing for the facilities. For the most part, EJ communities have not said that. That, that well, I didn't say EJ community said that. I said Ray Cantor said that. Yeah, Ray Cantor and says that. So to, to, to make itself feel good when it, when it puts these facilities in EJ communities. But yeah, the communities I, have consistently said, we don't want these facilities. I, I, I totally understand Nikki's position. Yeah, I, I get that. So you had, right, you had Highlands community say, hey, we're a pristine area. We want to preserve it to be pristine. They passed the law to, to do that. You had the Highlands. Hey, we have all this water down here. You can't develop down here either. I totally get, you know, Nikki and EJ's perspective. Uh, enough of dumping on us. We don't want this stuff here either. Me, me stepping back from the business community, looking holistically at the state, I'm throwing my hands up. Okay, where do we go now? We can't go here. We can't go there. We can't go there. Uh, we'll meet whatever standards you tell us to meet, but we can't go anywhere. So, you know, um, you know it, it just becomes a problem if we're looking to grow economically uh, in certain industries. Again, I totally get solid waste facilities. I totally get everything else. 
I wish the bill did not automatically deny new facilities and we could have had a larger conversation about conditions that may have been acceptable. But, you know, we, you know, it's, it's all well, back no now. Well, well, let's say this. Maybe you can't go to Highlands, but there's no, no law preventing you from going to Princeton. If you want to go to Princeton, have at it, Ray. You want to go to Short Hills? Have at it. <laughs> you want to go to Huntington? Go ahead. Law allows you to do that. George, you had a question. Oh, God. I, I mean, this is a great conversation. And um, the um, one of the reasons that uh, I've been perplexed is I don't want you to do what I did back in the 80s and throw up my hands and say, I, there's nothing I can do about this. Um, something's got to be done. We're going to have increasing proportion of our population be composited by minorities as we go forward. Industry, quite stationary sources in industry are, are actually dwindling um, for all the wrong reasons, but they are. And what's interesting is that, quite frankly, we've been focusing on stationary sources and not talking about mobile sources, which are probably more important than stationary sources when it comes to actual human impact. I want to, I want to say that sometimes if you're waiting for the data, you're going to wait forever. Sometimes, sometimes, and, and, and I'm serious here, you know, let's go back to Basel, Switzerland in the 1800s when they kicked Seba Geige out of the town because they, it didn't smell good and their water tasted bad without any mass uh, spectro, spectrophotometers or any gas chromatic gas, they knew there was a problem. And in this case, when there's, a, there's a problem. Somebody's ox has to be gored to solve that problem. And, and giving, giving of existing uh, major facilities a pass is not appropriate. State-of-the-art changes incrementally every year. So why can't we revisit what kind of controls are being placed on the existing industries and, and, and as well as new industries? So I guess my, my, only, my only concern here is that waiting is inappropriate. The, the mantra of public health is being overly conservative is not necessarily a bad solution. And we're not going to have the data on cumulative risk and, and, and because there's too many variables. And the one in a million risk is, is really un, untenable, quite frankly. So I, I guess the question is, what are we going to do? Whose ox is going to be gored? And by the way, I have my thoughts. And Nikki, I thought, presented a very compelling argument. Thank you. Thank you, George, for your position. I'm still trying to figure out what the question was that we can answer today. <laughs> the question is, what are we going to do now? <laughs> I thought the question was, was George there in 1800s when? Uh... <laughs> I was just a baby then. Well, I, I think it's it's uh, it, it's fair to say that this EJ uh, the regulations that come out pursuant to the law, the EJ law. Is, is really deemed a first step. In fact, I've heard that rhetoric from the DEP, mm -hmm. you know, we can only go this far now, but they have such a huge agenda with the climate change and EJ, which mirrors the federal, um, you know, climate change and EJ are, you know, are, are, are huge. And we seem to be the pace setters, but everybody looks at it as step one. Um, I don't know how to answer your question, George. I, I have no questions, else, Ray. If I anybody no else questions. can at this point, Phil, are there any other questions in the in the queue? No questions. I know we're past ten thirty, but yeah, no, no other specific questions. Just you know, comments on the fact of uh, you know, it seems that the uh, you know, the EJ law really wishes to protect, and the real question, and I think Nikki talked about it, is how far you know, and you listen to Nikki, and you listen to Ray Cantor, and how far does it go? Maybe it goes too far. Maybe it doesn't go far enough. And I guess until we see the rules and the regulations out and then the implementation, you know, the jury's still out. Well, to me, the rhetoric seems to be protection or maybe adaptation at this point to climate change, uh, implementation of a process to, uh, to have interaction um, and, and an opportunity to be heard by the EJ community. And frankly, you know, the state elevating those above the interests of um, financial interests uh, of the business community. That seems to be the rhetoric that I'm hearing from the state. Um, regs, you know, have to pass legal muster and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes down. Ray or Nikki, any, or Bobby, any, any final comments that you wanna offer? 
I'll, I'll just mention something and let Nikki, uh, you know, do cleanup. That you know, the, the spike. You know, I, hopefully, I didn't come off, you know, on, on a negative tone, largely on the law, because I think largely uh, we could we agree with the goals of the law. We could live with the law. Uh, I believe once the EP comes up with their regulations and we have more clarity and certainty of what's ex expected. Again, we think in some aspects, uh, it, it may go too far. Uh, in, in some aspects, uh, well, we definitely think that new facilities should not be an automatic denial. We wish the law had allowed for uh, it to be considered and conditions to be put on those facilities, because we think facilities can be benefits to the community. Right now, um, no matter how beneficial, the uh, DEP must say no uh, if there's a disproportionate impact found just based on the stressor and not on, on the health impact. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I, I'm optimistic you know, in the future. And I think largely, Nikki and I would probably agree about 90% of how to improve these communities. And uh, I'm gonna offer to him once the rules come out to sit down and, and talk about it. And maybe we could come up with some really good things that the business community and your community can, you know, uh, agree on to improve all of New Jersey, including uh, all overburdened communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, 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 we'll take Ray uh, up on that. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think we need a paradigm shift. I mean, I, I see a question in, in, in the chat. You know, we, we, we don't think the polluting facilities bring a lot of jobs to the communities, uh, prosperity. We think they may bring jobs to prosperity to Mm -hmm. um, to the state, but not necessarily to those communities. What is bringing mostly to those communities is, is pollution. But, you know, we need a paradigm shift, even if that was true. If that was true, which we don't believe is true, certain you, most of us don't live, do not have to make a choice between jobs and pollution. Right? Most people live in communities where you don't have to make that choice. And uh, people that live in communities of color and low-income communities should not have to make a choice either. And we need to move to a paradigm where all of us can have a good life without living with pollution that's killing us. That's the ultimate goal. I, I actually have one more question, even though we just summed up. I wanted to direct this to Nikki, because I remember when we gave a presentation before, you know, regarding decarbonization and electrification of the transportation sector. Mm. Yeah. You know, the state's made a big deal about cutting, you know, decarbonizing and, and set a schedule for doing that. Yet, I remember you bringing up the, the fact that how does, how has that really affected the EJ community? They're not necessarily the ones taking care, uh, advantage of the incentives. They're more likely to be the ones riding the bus than, you know, buying those cars. Any, any comment in that regard? Yeah, well, that and and I, in this presentation, I said that's the other presentation. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Sorry well, to open up a whole can of words. No, no, I'm glad you asked. I like to. I mean, I, I think New Jersey is a leader in cumulative impacts now, but when it comes to climate change mitigation policy and EJ, it's not. And you know, we've been av advocating that climate change policy should should be used to address some of the disproportionate pollution burden along with the cumulative impacts law that you yeah. see in that. Um, in the figures that I showed, and some mechanism should be in those laws to guarantee that you get reductions in those communities. And, and right now, that, that's not happening. And so we're trying to engage in the state to make that happen too, Ray. We'll see yeah, how- I, I only bring it up because of these are two areas that are getting prime focus yeah. from the state, and they sort of move, should be, I see them moving together sort of hand in hand, hopefully on a similar time frame. Yeah. No, thank, and, thank and you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, so, so, since you brought it, let me just throw in, in one last comment on that. Um, I, I much of the pollution in New Jersey, I, I know there's localized issues, are really coming, as, as mentioned before, from the transportation sector. Once we begin to clean up the port and the airport and get more EVs or non-polluting cars, you know, you know, on, on our roads, I think it's going to have a tremendous impact on the health of New Jersey and statewide. And then particularly, you know, in the densely populated northeast part of the state where we have, you know, many uh, of our overburdened communities. So uh, uh, we've come a long way in New Jersey from the time when George went down to Camden and saw that, uh, uh, how intolerable it was. 
um, you know, uh, we have a lot more to, to go. And I think working on that transportation sector is going to be a very important initiative. Great. Okay, we're going to, I think we're going to cut it now. Um, I know that a recording has been made and I know that CPE is going to have this and I assume the slides will be made available on your website as well, Phil. As long as we have the slides, we can make them available to anybody. And of course, mm -hmm. we will uh, we will post the uh, the um, recording within about forty eight hours. I know I sent you uh, Ray Cantor and Nikki Sheets' slides, Bob. And perhaps you could send your slides on to Phil, and they'll all be available for those that ask questions about will the slides be available. I want to thank CP for giving us extra time. Uh, I always find the repartee and the Q&A to be the most interesting, and I think it certainly was very interesting today and wish we had more time. If people have questions, although it's not my outfit, it's George and Phil's, I'm sure you can direct them to them. And if they're, if they want to filter them out to me and, uh, or Bhavani, Ray, and Nikki, you know, uh, I'd be happy to take a look at them and, 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 and address them as they come up. Hey, and Ray, so I want to, I, 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 Phil, I'm, before we, we cut out, I just want to thank everybody for a great conversation. Um, lots to think about, lots to respond to. And I also, um, it's obvious that we need to do something about transportation. Thank you, Balvany. Thank you, Raymond, both Raymonds, particularly Ray Papperman, who took the bull by the horns and, and organized this whole thing. And Dr. Sheets, thank you so much. Really appreciate your input. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Everyone stay safe, be well. Amen. Thank you all. Great job.